Believe it or not, this first scary story is actually a personal one. It happened to me, the creepy fox. I actually sent this over to Joelle last year. That's a let's read for those of you who don't know. Uh, for those of you who didn't watch that video, well, here's that scary story to start off today's stories. Enjoy. And also make sure to subscribe if you are brand new. This was something that happened to me when I was 11 years old, so 2003. I remember it very clearly because of how it affected me for weeks and how I'd wake up at night thinking this guy was outside my window. I guess when you're a kid, things like this seem a lot more scarier than usual, but then again, if somebody is threatening you, it doesn't matter the age, you're bound to feel some sort of emotion. On this Saturday morning, I was in my living room watching the newest episode of Pokemon on Kids WB with my cousin, who for this retelling I'm going to refer to as Julia. Julia had been spending a few days over at my house as this was in the summertime, and naturally she's on summer break just like me. Taking care of us this morning was my grandmother who had moved in with us just a few years earlier in 1999. As for my sister, my mom, and my dad, I remember clearly that morning that they had gone to the mall to take my sister shopping along with one of her neighbor friends. We're halfway through the episode, enjoying our bowl of cocoa pebbles and laughing at the shenanigans that Ash, Pikachu, and company are getting themselves into when the house phone started to ring. Now, as a kid, I never answered the phone as that was usually left to either my mom or my dad, but as they're not home, who was going to answer? Now, my grandma could have answered, but she didn't speak English very well. Spanish was her main language. So after the phone did its normal ringing routine, it stopped and rang again. I figured, what the heck? Let's just see who it was, as I got up and I made a short five second walk over to the little table the phone was placed on to answer. Hello, good morning, I answered in my kind, respectful tone. Hey, open the door, I'm outside, a voice whispered to me. I took a few seconds to look over at my cousin and I asked her if she heard anyone outside on the front porch. We do have a window that lets you see outside, however it doesn't give you a great view of the front door. That's why she responds back to me and says she didn't see anyone. So I remove my hand from the phone, which I did so the person on the other end couldn't hear me, and I responded back by saying they might have the wrong number. It turned out that stating this was going to lead to quite the interesting. Scratch that threatening conversation. I want the drugs. Open the door, this guy states, continuing in their whispering tone, but now mixed with some anger. Clearly this guy has the wrong number. Well, I immediately hung up, only for the phone to ring ten seconds later. I know I shouldn't have answered, but I did just for the heck of it again. Now, bear in mind that this isn't all verbatim and it's not word for word, but it is very close to what I remember him saying. Why did you hang up on me? Don't you care about your patience? At this moment, I started to get a feeling that I might be dealing with someone who might have been off their medication. After all, I remember the mentioning of drugs, medication, and them being a patient. My cousin can see the fright on my face and she tells me I should just hang up. My grandma at this point has no idea what's going on, since we are speaking in English, and she's in her room knitting a blanket, not really much to grab her attention. Again, I should have just hung up at this point, but I for whatever reason decided to try and calm this person down. I don't know, I guess I was just trying to be a good kid. Hey, you got the wrong number, and besides, I'm a kid. I think you need to check your phone number. I won't ever forget what he told me immediately after this, even as I write this out and I narrate it back to you all. 
it still gives me a bit of chills. I'm going to kill you. Just you wait. I'm going to break in through the window. I freeze at that moment. My cousin, who is standing next to me, listening in on the conversation, takes the phone away from me, then hangs it up, before I began to shake uncontrollably. I mean, let's face it. It's not every day that some crazy man threatens to kill you over the phone, especially when you're in the middle of watching Pokemon. Now, just as I mentioned a few seconds ago, I wasn't sure if this guy knew that he was talking to a kid. After all, kind of weird for an adult to state those things. But after I snapped out of it, we grabbed the phone again and dialed 911. My main concern became that this was a real thing, and this crazy lunatic was really outside our house. After all, they were whispering and speaking in a lower voice. Anyway, we got my grandma's attention, and we ended up waiting about 7 or so minutes for the police to arrive to my house. We made sure to look through the people, fearing we would see some crazy-eyed man staring back at us. But instead, it's a couple of police officers. What a relief that was. Well, they did a complete search of the backyard, the side of the house, and every little possible hiding spot, but came back empty-handed. While that was a relief, I was still pretty paranoid and spooked by the random creepy phone call. The police reassured myself and my parents, who by now had arrived home, that they would do some extra patrols in the neighborhood, and if we saw any suspicious activity or received any more threatening calls, we were to let them know. Luckily, we never did get any calls like that again. However, something interesting happened about a month later back at school. I was talking to some classmates about video games, and the conversation of being home alone popped up. I told my classmates about the strange call I had received, and one of them says that they had a similar experience. Same thing of a random stranger calling about prescription drugs and how if they didn't open the door, they would come in and kill them. This classmate, whose dad was in the garage working on his car, immediately went out to the front yard with his shotgun, only to find that there was nobody there. The cops were called, and nothing. As I mentioned before, while nothing ever turned up of this man, I think that's what makes it that much more frightening. Never getting a proper conclusion, and fearing for weeks, the calls would come back again. Summer of 97. I was 9 years old, and I was scared of my own shadow, so this experience only furthered my fear of the world. My mom and I drove up from Revere, Massachusetts, to Bear Brook State Park in New Hampshire to camp. My dad was going to drive up the next morning to meet us because he had to work. So everything was going normal at the campsite. We set up the tent, built our fire, all was well. It was still daylight when we noticed that the lone, greasy-haired man in the campsite connected to ours was continually running and leaping onto a wooden post, then attempting to balance himself on one foot. He kept doing this over and over and over. It was odd, but we just figured that he was some loony and had a good laugh at his expense. My mom thought maybe he was trying out for the circus. Cut to nighttime. Absolute darkness, if not for the campfire. My mom and I were sitting and roasting s'mores over the flames when we heard footsteps approaching from the other campsite. Out of the pines, the lone man stumbled onto our sight, and he was ghastly raged in the firelight. I could tell my mom was tense. She asked the stranger what he needed. Hey, he mumbled, I need your help in my campsite. We waited, and he didn't go on. My mom asked what he needed help with. The filthy man said, I locked my keys in my van. I need you to come over and help me. He then looked at me and said, 
Don't worry, kid. You can stay here with your fire. I remember getting goosebumps at that. My mom said, I don't know how I can help you with your keys. Come on, you must have a spare hanger lying around somewhere, suggested the man. My mom told him she didn't. The ghoulish man wouldn't let up though. Yeah, you must have a hanger lying around here somewhere. Maybe you dropped one on the ground near your tent. My mom adamantly told him she didn't have a hanger and quickly added, My husband will be here soon. Maybe he can help you. He's a pretty strong guy. Uh, yeah, all right. The creep slurred and he started to trudge away into the dark. But he turned his head and said, well, if you do find a hanger, come help me. I'll be here. And with that, the horrible man left. My mom and I barely slept that night. I felt her moving at every sound outside the tent. Looking back, my poor mother must have stayed up through the long night, worrying a butcher knife was going to slash through the tent wall. And so morning eventually came, and when we stepped out of the tent, we immediately saw that the lone man and his camper van were long gone. Later in the day, I heard my mom exclaim. I ran over to her and watched as she picked something up from the ground beside our tent. She held it between us, staring at it, not speaking. It was a metal hanger. Edit. I also found out later in life that four dead females were found stuffed into metal barrels in Bear Brook State Park back in the 80s. I went out with my friends one weekend in high school and I came back very late. I didn't want to wake my mother up by going through the front, so I went around the back to use the patio doors in the back. There's a separate two-bedroom house in our backyard. This is where my older sister lives by herself. I stopped walking towards the patio doors when I passed her house and I noticed all the lights in her house on and the front door wide open. I figured she was going out that night and was on her way out to the door. I thought about saying hello, but then I realized something was off. It was dead silent, like the house was empty. Why would she leave her house like that with the door open and all the lights on? Who does that? Maybe. Of course, at 16 years old, I like to entertain the possibility of something exceptional happening whenever I had the opportunity because it made life extraordinary. Every knock at the door could be a long lost brother come home at last and any package in the mail could contain a severed finger wrapped in a ransom note. I had no doubt an unfettered imagination. Into adolescence, I learned not to let it take over my life, especially in situations like this, but the silence was deafening and all I could picture was a gloved hand struggling to stay cupped over my sister's mouth, a knife pressed to her throat. I kept every cell in my body absolutely still to better listen for movement, trying to drown out the symphony of crickets and other things preventing me from knowing what was happening. I reasoned that she probably left the house in a hurry or was in the main house, until I heard a very defined creak in the floorboards break the silence. Half a minute later, I heard another. Whoever was just out of my view wasn't talking. They were sneaking, aware someone else was there. I myself stayed in the dark, avoiding the spotlight created by the light coming from the doorway. I pressed flat against the side of her house and peeked my head in through the doorway. I caught a glimpse of the figure moving into the other room just as I peeked in, certain only that someone was now in the guest room waiting for me to move. My rational voice suggested that it was one of her friends, drunk and in the mood to play games with a teenager's imagination. Knowing someone was hiding in the dark in the room next door would terrify any rational human being, but I blame the feeling of invincibility that comes with youthful naiveness 
on why I decided to actually step into the house, believing that this was the big Hollywood role I was destined to play. I was the star. In a slasher movie, I couldn't die because the filmgoers still wanted to see me running, hiding in closets, crying, unmasking the killer, and delivering a witty quip before blowing the killer up with seven tons of TNT or something, even if it was dangerous. Nothing was going to happen, because again it was happening to me. The floorboards were creaking louder, almost as if on purpose, as I sneaked up to the guest room. Whoever was in this room knew I was in there, and coming for them. But the guest room door was open, and the lights were off. I could only see darkness and my own silhouette, sharp and black against the light coming in from the guest room. The sight of myself and how revealed I felt seized my very inch. I shrunk, expecting to see the silvery glimmer of a knife in that unforgiving darkness. They knew where I was standing now, at least, I thought to myself. I did expect to die at any second, so I did not move. I just scanned the dimness in a frenzy, eyes going wide. In what was maybe ten seconds standing in the doorway, paralyzed by the idea of someone staring back at me, hidden in the dark, I had felt an hour pass. Nothing had happened. All my blood was still accounted for. So, it was my move. I didn't dare take my eyes off the darkness, so I felt along the wall for the light switch. My hands shook so much that I almost laughed. I was so wrong for thinking all those slasher film victims were overreacting. You really do panic in the face of death and you lose control of what you do. I had never felt so immersed in the unknown. Anyway, I found the switch and flipped. I saw movement and closed my eyes, bracing myself and then heard the whirling of the ceiling fan. The second I processed that it was the fan moving, I felt like the child that runs to his parents' room about seeing something under the bed. The situation was almost too soon, something I could handle. Anybody who was in this room was hiding, scared of me, and therefore cowardly and not a match. Even better, I hoped it could be someone playing a joke. So I turned the light on. It was time to stop playing around. Nothing. Awesome. What the hell is wrong with me? I thought. But then I felt my knees go weak, thinking about the shutter closet. It was immediately to my left, and the shutter door was open, so I couldn't see in it from the doorway. Anyway, I took two steps forward, head turned. I see feet. He sees some part of my body, at least. There is another man in this room with me, and we are about to make eye contact, I thought. I didn't stop to think about how dangerous a person wearing sandals could actually be. My demand for closure prohibited it. His eyes were wide and watery from trying to see in the dark, just like mine. Like a mere image. We both jumped and scanned each other's appearance, relaxing that the other was at the very least a person. His arms were flat next to his sides, head tilted back, seized in fear like I was. I assumed he wasn't a burglar, at least he certainly wasn't dressed as one. He had on swimming trunks and a tank top, a towel around his neck, and flip-flops, which is why I probably stuck around thinking it was my sister's friend or something. What are you doing here? I asked. It took him a second. Nothing, man. I was dying of thirst, so I just came in here to get some water. He said like a child, caught in the dead of night, with his hand in the cookie jar. For some reason, but probably just to stall, I asked the same question again, and he repeated the same answer. I looked down at his hands. His fingers were black, the way car mechanics do after handling grease all day. I looked back up at him and just mouthed, No, no, flight. Here it was. I wanted it so bad. Here it was. 
my own little horror film, running with no form as fast as I could for my life. I expected to get shot in the back at any moment, so I made it out of my sister's house and to the back door of the main house. I turned while running to see him. He was right behind me, and I just hoped he was just going to book it and turn left because he was so close to me that he definitely would have caught me. Mom, there's a burglar in the house, I yelled as soon as I could get the patio door open. She came out screaming, the dogs barking behind her, adding to the chaos. I turned and locked the patio door. She then grabbed the phone. We looked out the front window as low as we could and saw him kneeling at the corner of the house, hiding and waiting to see what we'd do. He grew impatient, hopped our fence, and got into a little white sedan and left. The cops came an hour later, thinking that the burglar had already left by the time we had made the phone call. Of course, this gave the police plenty of time to get there, because deranged criminals that hide in closets would never think to come back to take care of eyewitnesses, right? Monday afternoon, after I'd come home from school, my mom tells me, I want you to watch the news at 6 today. I think they caught the guy you ran into. 6 p.m. rolls around, and the top story is about a man who had gone on a crime spree over the weekend that ended in tragedy. I sat square in the middle of the sofa, cradling my head, hands over mouth, bouncing my knee wildly, waiting to see his face. This man went into a random family's house, just like mine, and stole a car at knife point. The family called 911 after he left. The cops spotted him on the road and tried to pull him over. He fled, and in pursuit, crashed into another vehicle, killing the driver and putting the passenger, her child, in critical condition. Police say, Rodney D., I stopped listening. It was him. They showed his mugshot during the report, and I felt that dropping sensation in my stomach. It was him. I couldn't mistake it. This was the terrified intruder I found standing in my sister's closet, hiding two feet away from me less than 48 hours ago. To this day, I still wonder if the cops had showed up promptly would the woman he killed the day after still be alive? It's not a jab at how well the police did their work, but amusing about the crucial nature of communication skills and how neglecting them can put another's life in great danger. Fearful burglar, let's not meet. By the way, he got 30 years. For context, this is from the perspective of a male. I was 13 years old when this happened, and it stands as one of the more freakier incidents of my life. Back in 2001, during spring break, my family and I decided to go to Tijuana to visit my aunt and cousins for a couple of days. While the experience didn't take place in Mexico, it does take place the night before we got there in the city of San Diego, California. The reason we had stopped in San Diego, instead of just continuing on another hour and a half deep into southern Tijuana, it was because my dad, who had been driving, since my mom doesn't know how to drive, was completely exhausted and wanted to get some rest. I couldn't really blame him since we had been driving all day from northern California and his back had to have been killing him. So after stopping to get some dinner at a Burger King, because who doesn't love their chicken nuggies and french fries drenched in barbecue sauce, we checked into a Motel 6 at roughly 8pm and we soon are relaxing in our own room. My mom and dad ended up falling asleep almost instantly, but I myself stayed up a bit longer playing Pokemon on my Game Boy Color. At about 11 p.m., I was starting to get a craving for some snacks, so I crawled out to the comfort of my bed 
quietly tiptoed over to the small closet that we left our stuff in, and I looked into my dad's bag of treats. I noticed all that was left were Fritos. I'm not really a big fan of Fritos, even today. So after almost deciding to just get some and deal with it, I remembered that just across the street, there was a 7-Eleven. Normally my parents wouldn't have allowed me to have gone over there on my own, and while I was going to wake one of them up, I knew for a fact they were going to say no. Well, alrighty then, what were my options? I could just ignore my cravings and be a good kid, or I could be a rebellious one and grab a few dollars from my dad's wallet, quietly sneak out and walk over to the 7-Eleven and be back way before they notice I'm gone. So the plan was set. I slipped into my tennis shoes, put on my sweater, opened the door ever so slowly, taking advantage of both my parents being heavy sleepers, and I'm now making my way over to get my food. Two minutes later, I'm in the 7-Eleven, being welcomed by the employee at the cash register. I said hello and then make my way over to the aisle of chips, where I opted to get some Cheetos and then some Twinkies in the neighboring aisle. With those secured, I made my way toward the back where all the sodas are located so I could grab myself a Pepsi. And at this moment, I happen to turn to my right and I look out the window. Standing there, just staring at me with this very strange expression across his face was what I guessed to be a homeless man. I recall his disheveled appearance as his eyes continued to follow every one of my movements. It did freak me out a bit, but I ignored him and I quickly grabbed my drink and I head to the cashier so I can pay. Hey, did you notice the man standing outside? I asked the cashier out of curiosity. No, I'm afraid I haven't. Did he do something to you? He asks me while scanning my snacks and placing them into a little plastic bag. Oh, I guess it's nothing really. Sorry, I asked. He then hands over my food, and I'm now ready to return back to the motel so I can enjoy my salty and sugary snacks. This night, however, was going to take a turn for the worst. As I exit the 7-Eleven, I am immediately interrupted by the homeless man who was staring at me a minute earlier outside the window. I looked over to him and I thought he was going to ask me for money, so I quicken my pace. He starts to quicken his pace as well, and in my head, I'm telling myself, tell him to go away. I do utter those words, and when I turn back around to look at him again, all the hairs stand up on the back of my neck. He's now got a pocket knife, and he's telling me to hand over any money or valuables I have on me. Too bad for him, all I had was the bag of Cheetos, Twinkies, and the Pepsi. Hand over your wallet, kid, or you're going to get stabbed, I recall him saying in a very strange tone. No way was I staying around. I start my engines, so to speak, and I bolt across the crosswalk. Luckily, being welcomed by the sight of the light being red, I did notice in my peripheral vision a vehicle pull up at the light and it wasn't until I hear someone yell to drop the knife that I look behind me. It was a police officer. Thank God. The creep, seeing that he's busted, actually drops the knife and surrenders right there and then. That was probably the best thing that he could have done. In any case, I did get in trouble with my parents for going out without their permission, but the fact I was unharmed and safe did override their anger. That was essentially the end to my experience. I would give officers my statement, and after it all, they left. The next day we made it to my aunt's house, but admittedly, I was pretty exhausted 
and still a bit traumatized. Anyway, that was the story of the time I got chased by knife-wielding man, but luckily, a police officer was there at the right place at the right time to help me out. A listener discretion on the following story as it does contain some details of self-harm, so if you're somebody that might find that disturbing, then please use the timestamps that are available in the video. Anyway, if you're okay with it, here's the story. I'm hoping that this is okay here. It was a really creepy thing to me, and it is something I've had a hard time getting over. About a decade ago, I was a sophomore in high school, and we had a big 9-10 to 10 day long trip to Europe. We could take it if we took a foreign language class. I signed up the year before, and I worked to pay for it myself, and it was a really big deal to me because I'd spent a whole summer paying for it, etc. And my family is low class, and no one has ever left the country. Now, because in New Hampshire, schools aren't that big, we had to combine the kids from three different schools for the trip. There was a girl named Maria from a different town. She was kind of the opposite of me. Loud, confident, comfortable in her sexuality, even though she was somewhat chubby, etc. At the time, I was kind of discovering my own sexuality slash gender identity, and I was really awkward. Somehow, I became friends with her by default. We were sat next to each other on the bus to the airport, then on the plane. We kind of ended up spending a lot of time together by coincidence, and ended up chatting and kind of becoming temporary BFFs. I was basically like, hey, someone likes me, because in my school, I was bullied a lot. So I started to notice some off things about her. She would randomly talk about super personal things, things like her mom being a druggie and her being molested. She said she was in love with one of the teachers and she was sure he really cared about her because he was really friendly to her. Now, the first half of the trip was in Spain. We were in Madrid, but we spent a day in Toledo at a place where they made really cool swords. Some of us brought stuff but she made a point of saying she didn't want to waste her money on the train to France. She showed me the first porn I've ever seen, and we talked about how her 70-year-old dad was dying of AIDS and all kinds of other things. She said she had been a prostitute when she was 12 to 13. She talked about how much she really liked me. France is where everything got really messed up. To this point, I know she sounds just talkative, but she was everywhere I went. She happened to be seated next to me everywhere. She showed up at a shop I was in when we had free time to wander. I'd find her walking into the bathroom right after me. We checked into our French hotel, and unlike the Spanish one, we couldn't be all on the same floor. Most of the kids were on the fourth floor, and a few were on the fifth. Maria was assigned as my hotel partner, and we were the only kids on the third floor. There wasn't even one of the chaperones on that floor. That evening was free, and we spent it in our hotel room, just hanging out. We were all tired from not really sleeping on the train the night before. Maria got into more weird stuff about how the teacher loved her, and weird stuff about being gangbanged of all things. She got into my bed. It was bunk beds. I know, super classy sounding, right? But I swear we had bunks. And decided to lay with me and just talk. I have crazy social anxiety. And I felt really awkward. And she was also really my type. That's what she said. And she said that I wanted to have sex with her. So I just kind of let her talk at me about all this stuff. And she starts to go on about how I'm the only person who has ever really listened to her and how great I was. I fell asleep holding her. In the morning, I woke up and she was looking at me. Like, really looking at me. 
like I was a puzzle she was figuring out. I can't explain it. It was really weird. She was creeping me out. And finally, she looked like she decided whatever issue was going on in her head. And she asked me to go get her a cup of coffee from the floor that had the hotel breakfast. I did and felt pretty good. I was thinking maybe I could get the nerve to kiss her or something that day. I got in the elevator to go out to the floor and some other kids from my group were in there with me. It stopped on three. I went to get out and this guy from my trip stopped me from leaving the elevator. He literally bear hugged me and patted my hair like a mom and pushed me back and hit the button to go to a different floor. I was freaking out. I asked if something happened to my roommate because all I saw were some people hunched around the doorway of my open hotel room door and there's blood. I honestly have a hard time remembering those minutes because I'm the kind of person who watches forensic files and shit like that always goes to the worst. So I'm like somehow in the 10 minutes I'm getting her coffee, something awful happened to my roommate. I ended up getting questioned by the police, being 15 and not speaking French. It was a bit stressful. At first, my roommate claimed that all night there were loud bangs and stuff in the hall and that when I went to go get her coffee, I didn't close the door completely and some foreign guys came in, went through our stuff and attacked her. She had a big knife stuck in her leg, in her thigh. That's where the blood came from. Now, because of what happened, I had to be questioned in case she was covering me, attacking her. The truth is much crazier, however. The knife that was in her leg, she claimed to have never seen. The thing is, it was from the same sword place we went to in Toledo, in a completely different country. Does it make sense that someone would follow from Spain to France to stab a 16-year-old? After a day of questions, and crying as well. The teacher brought me to Maria in the hospital. Before I went in, he asked me, looking straight into my eyes, did she ever say anything to you to suggest she would hurt herself? She had gone on about being a cutter, etc. And I just told him everything. I went into the room and she was crying and so happy to see me. She insisted the whole time that her story was true Later that day, we got the video from the hotel hallway. No one broke into our room. The teacher felt awkward from her crying, and he asked if I wanted to talk to her alone. He left the room. Maria held me really close, crying. She said I was the nicest person she had ever met, and she said she decided it would be easier to stab herself. Now, I wish I could share the intonation of this sentence. When she said herself, it was clear her original intention was to stab someone else, that someone else being the sleeping person in her hotel room. She had planned this from early in the trip, in Spain, or possibly before the trip. I don't really know. She liked me because I listened to her, and she decided to just stab herself. She said it was like she was doing me a favor, or giving me a gift. She gave me her email address and told me to message her when I got back to the United States. She was getting what she wanted and she had planned for the teacher she liked to fly home with her that evening as soon as the hospital let her go. So crazy hotel room stabber, let's never meet again. This happened when I was a bartender about four years ago, but I think about it often and has changed the way I operate throughout life. I now refuse to go to any store alone after midnight. Now for the story's sake, I will tell you that I was 25 and an attractive slash slender blonde at the time. On a busy Friday night, I was bartending with the bar manager and he had been noticing that we were very low on some bar necessities after the dinner rush, such as lemons, limes, bitters, that kind of thing. 
So I was sent out to go to a 24 hour grocery store down the road so I could go pick up the odds and ends that would require to get us through the weekend. I picked up everything that was asked of me without trouble at the store until I got to the liquor aisle. There were two country looking guys that were probably around my age in the aisle and they were staring at me and whispering to each other in a way that made me really uncomfortable as I assumed they were making comments about me. All pretty innocent so far. Now before they could approach me, I grabbed what I needed very quickly and power walked to the self checkout. I really booked it out of there because when you're a bartender, it's kind of like you're on stage and are required to be charming and interact with people that you otherwise absolutely wouldn't be able to tolerate unless you're getting paid to. That's why I'm not a bartender anymore. I get to the self checkout and hot on my tail are the two guys. I'm scanning my stuff and they use the scanning station next to me. I get a better look at them now that they're right next to me. One is taller, muscular, and average looking. The other is shorter and more plump. They both look dirty and their eyes were completely bloodshot. Not sure if they were high on something or had already been drinking for a while. They continue to stare at me and our eyes awkwardly met. So I did the pleasant midwestern thing to do and flashed them a quick half-assed closed-lipped smile to be polite. The taller one starts trying to talk to me. Hey, looks like you're ready to party, huh? I replied with something like, yeah, something like that. It's not for me though. They walk closer to me and ignore the responsibility to scan their items. Oh, must be your boyfriend, huh? I flash the awkward tight-lipped smile again and roll my eyes slightly. Like, this is your hint that I'm not interested, fellas. The taller one continues to try to talk to me. You could come hang out with us tonight. We could show you a really good time, if you know what I mean. I reply with, No thanks, I'm good, I have plans already. Well, the tall one starts to get upset that his moves aren't working like he'd hoped and starts using a more threatening tone and moves very close to me, like two inches away. But I ignore him, staying focused on the scanner. I don't think he had showered in a few days by the smell of him. He gets a little louder and says, I see how it is. You probably just sleep with doctors and rich men like that. You think you're too good for us. We can show you that you aren't. We can teach you a lesson. Now I'm not sure in what context he meant, but it definitely wasn't good. Still not looking at him, I turn away so my body is blocking his view of my purse, which I set on the scanner. This is to grab my 4 inch pocket knife out and slide it up my jacket sleeve in case I need to protect myself, acting like I'm searching for my wallet. I do this however, in view of the self-scan worker standing at her podium and I look at her with wide eyes, trying to communicate that I do not feel safe and that I might need some help. I turn back to the machine and slide my credit card to pay, while the creepy and hostile guys are practically standing on top of me. The machine malfunctions and starts beeping. The lady worker comes over immediately and the guys standing next to me change their expressions from, I'm planning to torture you for a couple of days and toss your body in a creek, to just your friendly good old country boys making polite conversation over here. They actually try to act like I knew them and we were friends, so the worker wouldn't be alerted to their ill intentions. They tried joking with the worker, saying I was stealing something and that's why the machines went off. The worker was definitely not buying it. She was six plus feet tall of a woman, with even some muscle on her by the way. I wouldn't mess with her, even on my best day. Anyway, she presses a few buttons on the screen, shooting the guys a very unimpressed look when they were trying to act charming and cancels the order completely. 
She turns to me and says, I'm sorry for the inconvenience, ma'am. This machine seems to not be working correctly. Why don't you gather your things, and I will ring you up at the actual register. She puts her hand on my back and gives me a wide-eyed look, like I gave her a minute earlier, letting me know that she sees that I'm in danger. I pick up my things to follow her to a register that is near the security office. The guys linger around the self-scan, still glaring at me, and eventually complete their purchase, but stand at the exit, assuming they are waiting for me. I felt like I would be walking to my death if I made my exit in that moment. The worker keeps a close eye on the guys and scans my items. As she's scanning, she tells me there really wasn't anything wrong with the machine I was using. It's just misread my credit card. She said, I had a bad feeling about those guys from the moment they walked in, and then I saw them getting aggressive towards you. I already rang a security to be ready to walk out to the parking lot and to make sure you left safely when you were ready to leave. Then I saw you take that knife out and put it in your sleeve, getting ready to protect yourself. Good girl. As much as I'd like to see you show them they picked the wrong chick to mess with, I'm glad I was able to pull you aside and make sure you are safe. I see them waiting by the door for you. I'll just keep pressing buttons on the screen and act like I'm having trouble with your order until they give up and go outside. Our security officer and I are both still going to escort you to your vehicle when you leave. I thought to myself, this woman seriously deserves a raise. I thanked her over and over again and told her what they said to me and I was getting afraid because I don't know what these guys are capable of. As I'm talking to her, my bar manager calls me to see what's taking so long. I explain what's happening and he was obviously very concerned and ready to come up there himself and kick some ass. A sweet sentiment indeed. By the time I hang up, the guys had given up and walked out to the parking lot. The worker said to give it another few minutes because she had a feeling they may still be in the parking lot waiting for me to walk out and see which vehicle was mine so they could follow me. My instant thought was, no way, they have to be gone by now. I was wrong. The worker and security guard escort me out and as if it was after midnight, you can imagine how empty the parking lot was. Towards the back of the lot, there sat an old pickup truck running with its lights on, pointed towards the store. It was a huge parking lot, and it wouldn't have made sense for them to initially park like that, so I'm assuming they moved the truck to sit that way, so they had a full view of when I exited the store to go to my vehicle. It was like being stalked by very hungry lions. When I unlocked my car, and they saw that me, the worker, and the guard were looking directly at them and that I wasn't getting in my car until we watched them leave. They then peeled out to the parking lot. I mean, they seriously did a burnout to establish that they were pissed and trying to intimidate us or something like that. Huh? Poor creeps didn't get their way. Boo hoo. I thanked the worker and the guard over and over again as I'm certain they had just saved my life, or at the very least, saved me from having to live with whatever those guys were planning on doing to me. I did write a long letter to the store manager and to their corporate location, describing how their employees protected me and how grateful I was for the whole thing. I really hope that earned her a promotion, bonus, or a raise. She didn't know me at all and was ready to protect me, which really isn't her job to do, but she did it anyway. Needless to say, I do not go late night shopping by myself anymore, and I never will again. Edit. There's a few comments speculating that this experience is fake. Not sure why I'd make it up. This crap happens to women so much more than society would like to admit, or that this experience is exaggerated. My response to that is that this was years ago, as stated in the beginning. Memories can often be remembered more intensely as time goes on. You don't know when something significant is happening to you until it's over or when you're reflecting back on it. Obviously, the dialogue isn't verbatim, 
but I can honestly say that this is 100% how I remember this happening and I posted this only to try to help someone in the future to be more vigilant and as a great reminder that good people do exist just as bad ones do as well. I just hope that this story helps. Back in 2008, I was a student planning to go to university and I needed some extracurricular stuff that I could put on my entry applications. As most UK students know, one of the best to have on there is the Duke of Edinburgh Award. As part of this award, you have to embark on an orienteering expedition, basically a long trek through woodland and rural villages following nothing but a map and a compass. No GPS allowed. It's a teamwork experience and you camp and overcome hurdles together, etc. Anyway, I was out of shape at the time and so my uncle volunteered to take me out to the middle of nowhere so I could get some idea of what orienteering was like. We didn't stay out overnight to like what I would have to do during the real thing. However, we hiked maybe 10 miles through the woods and a small village in pretty abysmal weather. By the end of the journey, we were soaked to the bone and pretty miserable, looking forward to getting back to the car and heading home. For the last part of the journey, we were on a dirt trail heading uphill with bushes and trees on either side. We were marching onward in silence at this point when all of a sudden there was a rustling in the foliage to our left. From behind a large bush stepped an old man in a black suit with a red bow tie and dress shoes. He looked late 70s, early 80s, very pale, liver spots dotting his face and a grey slash white comb over. I was instantly weirded out. Who dresses like that to go into the woods? The instant thought, seeing a guy his age out there in those clothes, in those weather conditions, was, this guy has lost his marbles. There was something else that took me an extra moment to notice though, that puzzled me. The guy was bone dry, didn't even have mud on his shoes. We stopped in our tracks and just stared at the man for a moment, who appeared to be frozen and shocked at seeing us. My uncle made the first move, taking a step towards him, asking him if he was alright. The old man continued to stare for a moment, not moving even a twitch, then became suddenly very animated. It was like he suddenly snapped out of a trance. He started flailing his arms wildly, saying something awful had happened, that a good friend of his needed help. He began walking backwards into the woods, motioning us for us to follow him, which we ended up doing. We started off at a brisk walk, then escalated to running as we struggled to keep up with the old man. After maybe a minute, he disappeared ahead of us, but we could hear him so continued to follow the noise until we reached a huge slope. We stopped at the edge and looked down to see the old man standing at the bottom, motioning us, pleading with us to follow him. I remember looking down at the slope, and it was probably a 40 degree angle. It spanned for perhaps 50 feet or more, and was slick with mud. It looked like an accident waiting to happen, especially given there were no shrubs or roots to hold on to, or anything. I remember looking down at the old man on the other side of the slope and wondering how the heck did he cross that so quickly and so cleanly. I mean, at that distance, it is hard to see final detail clearly, but I swear he still did not appear to be wet or muddy at all. Me and my uncle looked at each other and I saw that he was getting as weirded out as I was. Now despite my feelings, I made a step toward the edge and was going to try and make my way down when my uncle grabbed me firmly by the arm and pulled me back. Under his breath, he said to me, something is wrong here. We took a few steps back from the edge at this point and the old man at the bottom started to get irritated. He began pleading with us again to come down the slope, 
telling us he needed our help. His friend was in trouble. My uncle shouted down to the old man that we would head back to our car and call emergency services for him, that professional help would be on its way soon, that they would have all the tools to help him out, etc. The old man suddenly got furious. He began jumping up and down, demanding that we come down the slope right now or there would be hell to pay. His voice had changed drastically. He was practically growling his words. His hands bunched up into fists, pounding his knees like an angry toddler who's throwing a tantrum. I've never seen a grown adult fly in such a rage in my life. His eyes looked like they were on the verge of bursting out of their sockets, his skin gone from pale to red in almost an instant. We began to hurriedly make our way back the way we came, his demands and threats getting less audible as we got closer to the trail. Once on the trail, we practically power marched the remaining quarter mile or so to the car, all the while my uncle was on the phone to the emergency services, explaining to them that there was possibly a mentally ill old man wandering the trail. We were ordered to get to our car and wait for the police so we could show them where we had encountered him. About an hour later, we met four officers, two of whom had dogs with them and packs of supplies like first aid, emergency blankets, etc. We led them to the exact spot and then pointed the two officers with dogs in the direction he led us through the bushes. The search lasted all weekend, but there was no trace of the old man. Officers said the only trail they could pick up had been mine and my uncle's. They didn't find any footprints or anything belonging to the old man that we encountered. Honestly, one of my weirdest experiences to date. So I moved into a duplex with my ex three years ago in what we thought was a safer part of the city. One of our neighbors, Amber, works in the duplex rental office and her husband, Ed, was at the time fresh out of prison. Later we would see all the swastika tattoos he had and he had been doing and continues to do landscape work for the rentals like mow the lawns, cut down trees, etc. Other than that, he is home mostly doing odds and ends things, like tinkering with his mower or truck or something. They both are super nice people, very kind and loving towards others, and always offer to help out. We have smoked weed together a few times, Ed smokes more than Amber, and have talked about all kinds of things, so I thought I could trust them and felt very safe being their neighbor. I once mentioned how sometimes, when I'm home alone, I hear steps in the attic over my room and what sounds like a chair being dragged. How sometimes the noise follows me around the house and always freaks me out to the point of calling someone just to feel a little bit safer until the noise dies down. Ed said, What, you think we're spying on you? In a laughing way, but it creeped me out a little. So then, I break up with my boyfriend and he moves out. This is recent, so a few months ago, Ed has started texting me, asking if I wanted a smoke while Amber was still at work. I declined every time, finding different excuses because I still felt uncomfortable around him. Then he asked if I wanted to have sex with him because he thinks Amber is cheating on him. I definitely shut that down and it was awkward as all hell. I didn't tell Amber because I didn't want to get kicked out or have some horrible awkward tension and I hate confrontation so I kept quiet. That's when I start to hear things in the attic above my room move more often. It freaked me out even more when I woke up to a loud bang outside my front door at about 3 or 4 am. When I went to examine it, there was a small lock pick outside my door on the ground but no one around. I kept the lockpick, and the next day, I texted a picture of it to Amber to let her know I thought somebody was creeping around, and she said, Oh, that's Ed, 
That's his ice pick, not a lock pick, sweetie. No one can pick your deadbolt with that. But I know the difference in a four and skinny ass lock pick and an ice pick. I'm so scared to be alone here, especially at night. Our addicts connect, and it's not outlandish to think that he could be up there spying on me. I even found a freshly drilled hole in the ceiling of my room. I just put wadded up paper in it and try not to think about it. I honestly hope nothing comes of it and I'm just being paranoid. Edit. For everyone saying to call the police, I really have no evidence. I have the lockpick still and pictures of my door being messed with, but when I've gone into the attic, it's been completely empty. I've never gone in alone because its opening is in my garage and there is no ladder so it does require two people. But as of now, it is a gaping hole above my washer and dryer and very hard to get into without good upper body strength. I'd call my ex to come home when the dragging would start and by the time he got there, it'd be cleared out. So I'm hesitant to report anything with no evidence. By the way, this is 100% true. I'm staying with my boyfriend until I move out in a few weeks, despite my neighbors being upset that I'm leaving. To address another thing, I didn't see any swastika tattoos until months after I'd been hanging out on their back porch to smoke with them. He had a shirt off for the first time, and there were at least three on his body. Confused me because Amber and Ed are super Wiccan. She has Wicca tattoos all over and stuff like that, and so I believe maybe his tattoos were for protection in prison. Either way, after all that, I stopped hanging out with them and I would only speak to them if we were both outside at the same time. And so let's start with a little bit of background. I'm 21 years old. I'm turning 22 years old this year, and I'm a musician. This happened two years ago, me being 19 years old at the time. I have a pretty chill relationship with my mom, as in we smoke weed together, chill. My stepdad is also pretty awesome in general, but doesn't smoke often. And since the crisis was still at its beginning in my country, and we had some money to spare, mom bought us tickets for a trip to Europe. We would get a plane to the United Kingdom and make our way around countries such as Spain, Portugal, the Netherlands, Belgium, etc. Time flew by very fast. Fun days. I even attended a music summer course when in the UK and I met some pretty nice, friendly and some attractive people. We were in Amsterdam, enjoying our stay in this beautiful, almost no cars, friendly city, smoking our asses off the best marijuana we ever had. That's when we met this guy. We were just outside a coffee shop bluebird, sitting on one of the outside tables, enjoying some OJ, coffee, and a spliff of a strain I can't remember. All the time, there is this guy which was sitting on the only other outside table, quite a small entrance by the way, enjoying his coffee. I wondered he must have been waiting for someone as he kept looking around. I was talking with my mom and stepdad just about random stuff in Portuguese. I'm from Brazil since there were no other people with us. Then out of nowhere, the guy on the other table is already getting his chair next to our table and asked if he could sit with us. Now being from the country I'm from, I'm usually naturally suspicious to that kind of behavior, but it seems us Brazilians get to behave pretty stupid abroad in general. I let my guard down, thinking that no way this place could be as dangerous as in Brazil. You don't stop to consider that shit happens everywhere else. Back to the story. We say yes to his request and start chatting. This man tells us that he's a musician, a lucky shot or he can understand Portuguese, I don't know. Jaime bombards him with questions and doesn't notice how he swiftly avoids them by giving generic answers and quickly changing the subject, asking stuff like where we were from, 
how long we would be staying. You know, typical shady people kind of questions. Pap, as he introduces himself, very kindly invites us to his place to check some of his music, blah blah blah. That's when the three of us enter the state that will last until the very end of the story. This feeling where we would constantly give looks at each other, looking for signs of discomfort and suspicion. At the same times, we're denying to ourselves that there is something odd about the whole situation. We agree and start walking towards this place. As we get further and further away from downtown, he insists that we take photos with him at random times, and during all conversation, he has this weird tone in his voice, kinda imperative, kinda polite, almost like he was hurting us. Finally, we get to his place, in a shady suburb, about 25 minutes away from downtown. Through the whole journey, our suspicion was slowly getting higher and higher. Anyway, we enter his apartment, and it doesn't look like the musician apartment you would expect. Just an old radio, some random poster on the wall, not even related to music, and a center table, everything covered with a sheet of dust. He heard at us one more time after failing to turn on his radio, which wasn't even plugged on the wall, straight to the kitchen, and sits us there, telling us that his son will be home soon and they can show us his music. Now you're probably wondering how the hell we didn't bolt the shit out of there. Answer, amnesia haze. Finally, after some five minutes, his son arrives, and holy shit, the guy was big. My stepdad is about six foot three, and this guy was a head taller than him, and bulkier as well. Finally, our alarms reach their peak, and we telepathically agree we should get the hell out of there. We say some lame excuse, because we said we didn't have plans before, I know, and that's when Pop grabs my mom by the arm, very strongly, staring at her. She kinda shocked, stared back, in some sort of defiance. He releases her, and we manage to leave unscathed. Now, I will leave you with this thought. 1. He picked his victims at a famous place. 2. He took pictures with us. Actually, he insisted on it. 3. It seems to me he wasn't concerned about the facial evidence in our cameras, nor that any previous victims, or us, would tell the police about his little scamming spot. To this day, I wondered of all the possibilities of what would have happened. Small chance it would be something harmless. I doubt it. Everything just screamed the complete and utter opposite. Also, I never found any of his music online. So thanks for the chat, Pap. Let's not meet ever again. It was summer break 2014, and at around 1pm my mom texted me to ask how my day was going, like she normally does. I responded by saying I'm just relaxing in the room playing some playstation with friends, and she then asked if I wanted to do anything later that night. This was Friday, so usually we go out as a family to eat or something. I told her I wasn't sure, and then she responded before returning back to work, saying, be ready tonight and put a change of clothing in a backpack. Well, what do you know, when my dad gets home, I asked him what my mom was talking about. My dad told me that it was a surprise and I would find out when my mom got home. And so long story short, my mom's boss had booked us a night at the Southern California Harris Casino Resort. We live in Brea, California, so it is quite a drive to get there, but we would be staying overnight, so it wasn't really a big deal. Also, just so you know, this comes from the perspective of an 18-year-old female, if it's of any importance to anyone. Anyway, now with that bit of context out of the way, so you know why we were on the road to begin with, let's get on to the really scary thing that happened to me. We pulled up to a gas station as I drank a lot of water beforehand at a Carl's Jr. 
and I was the only one to get out since my parents had done the smart thing of going to the restroom at that Carl's Jr. When I was inside the little store, I asked the gas station attendant if the bathroom was free to use or yet to buy something, but he said it's all good, just go in and do your thing. So I made my way down an aisle of chips, being greeted by some random people who were shopping for snacks, and at the end of the walkway I quite literally bumped into a random disheveled looking woman with tattered clothing on. She was really skinny and pale, and when she looked me in the eyes, I could see that I had made her quite angry. Watch where you're going, stupid. I apologized to her, not wanting to try and start something with some random woman I just met, and I walked past her and walked into the restroom. At this moment, I was just so laser focused on peeing since my body was quite literally shaking. My body would be shaking for another reason, however. Because while I sat there in the stall, I hear that woman's voice calling out to me and asking me where I was hiding and how she wasn't finished with me just yet. I could then hear her trying to open each of the bathroom stalls as she slowly but surely making her way down toward me. I don't know why I felt like I did, but something in me said that if I tried coming out, I was going to be in a world of trouble. At this point, I raised my legs up for her not to try and see me, and now I texted my parents, telling them there is some crazy lady inside the restroom looking for me. Almost like clockwork, my dad decided to call me, and stupid me had the ringer on for some reason. She was going to get to me either way, I thought, but now my dad has just sped up the process. The lady now started to violently shake at my door, telling me to come out and how she just wants to talk to me etc etc i peeked through the small opening of the door hinges and i swear to you i can see she's holding some sort of small knife i was basically crying at this point looking up at the ceiling and asking to myself why why is this happening to me it's not fair i now screamed as loud as i could which does get a reaction from the lady as she tells me to shut up and how it's hurting her ears yeah no kidding Honey, are you in here? I heard the restroom door open, and then I hear the crazy lady suddenly start to panic. My mom would now let out a scream as she relayed to me in that moment that the crazy woman ran up to her with the knife. Thank God, however, that she didn't try stabbing my mother or attacking her, as she says the woman just ran past her and then out of the gas station. Finally, the whole strange encounter seemed to have been over, but I was beyond frightened. It did take me quite an effort to get out of that restroom, but after washing my hands and hugging my mom ever so tightly, she escorted me out. The man at the cash register was now on the line with the police and asked if we could stay to speak to them. I was too scared at this point, so my mom joined me in the car and had it locked as my dad waited for the police inside the store. Two police officers would arrive and they would take my statement as others went to look for the woman. I pretty much just sat there in the vehicle with the window down, my mom hugging me the whole time while I gave my statement. No less than 10 minutes later, the police officers reported that they found a woman matching my description. Well, what do you know? They would ask me to identify her, and I told them, yes, that was her. She pretty much gave me a death stare and started spewing random nonsense at me. Needless to say, we left that gas station, but I was still really terrified to enjoy my time at the Harris Casino. Since that scary incident, I have now started carrying a knife with me, and my pepper spray on my keyring is there too, just in case I need to use it for emergency situations. But luckily, I have not had to use any of them just yet. I just hope none of you ever have something like this happen to you, because it's not fun whatsoever.